Well, the door is closed, so I guess it's time. Yeah, go for it. Yeah? Fantastic. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm uh, Lorenzo Mangani from uh, QXIP, uh, the company behind Homer, uh, Sip Capture, the HEP protocol, and a few other things. Actually, a good part of the team is here with me today. So FOSDEM is always the only occasion where we actually meet over the year. Andre, hey. <laughs> I see a lot of uh, uh, friends in the audience. So thank you for being here. Um, again, uh, really quickly, because we don't have a lot of time. Today we're going to present uh, some news about our project, specifically Omer 7, and uh, how it finally rejoins with the uh, RTC community. So a uh, little big picture of our stack, which has been evolving over time. For those of you who are not familiar with Homer, Homer is a uh, collector, uh, which is purpose for you know, uh, tracking and generating metrics, statistics, time series, indexing out of uh, data. Originally, we, are, uh, we were a uh, SIP-centric or you know, very SIP-focused platform. This is not scrolling right. Well, OK. Uh, so the, the platform has been uh, initially created to track uh, SIP. Then it evolved to also track uh, RTP, RTCP statistics, logs, and so on and so forth, until you know, RTC became popular and we had to rethink everything all over again, which is what really uh, happened in OMR 7. So OMR 7 is really a, an evolution of uh, the project, which tries to uh, get rid of some of our design limitations and open the doors to whatever is coming next. So we don't want to make the same mistakes again. Uh, so we dropped being uh, SIP-centric, we dropped being uh, uh, tied to specific databases, we dropped our internal way of doing statistics, we dropped the way we're doing correlation. We basically threw it all away. So we kept the concept of uh, Homer and we tried to rethink oops, how it works internally. So instead of having uh, you know, static map protocols, now we have custom ones. So anybody can take our platform, define a new protocol, uh, of course, SIP is going to be already there, but we you know, uh, did this to prepare for really events. So events coming from Janus, Mediasoups, and now also Jitsi uh, can be indexed, can be correlated with other protocols. It's, uh, it becomes a generic platform for collecting uh, data, flows, and events. So total rewrite, we threw it all away. The back end uh, was originally done in PHP, and it was a, a bunch of uh, excellent garbage that we couldn't maintain anymore. So we threw it all away. And we did it in the modern uh, uh, technology. So we picked Node.js just because there's a lot of people uh, that are good with it. So we can get uh, help and we can get contributions. Uh, again, designed to support any protocol. So this is going to be a generic uh, collector. Of course, it's uh, tailored to uh, voice and real-time communication. So it comes already with you know, some concepts that maybe other platforms don't have in terms of uh, tying things together and correlating. Um, it's integration ready, so we no longer uh, force people into our little island, come and see the statistics that are made for you, but we rather do the opposite. So we open it up so that we can send and stream whatever the platform is processing and generating to pretty much anything that's out there. Uh, and I'll show you some of this. Um, we went standalone, so mm, the previous versions of Homer could only be uh, assembled using uh, OpenSIPs and Camailio as uh, shells for the capture functions. This is no longer the case, so we have our independent capture servers and agents. Uh, we have two branches. One is in Go, and it's uh, you know, uh, tailored for performance and stability. The other one is in Node.js, and it's tailored for hacking. Uh, I'm working on the second one, of course. And then uh, we try to turn the project into a building block for other people to do the same thing we did in their platform. So Homer, until the previous version, was something that you had to install and use, and that was it. Uh, now we want to allow people just to use, um, let's say, a headless version of Homer where they provide the API, they provide the UI, sorry, they provide the visualization or the integration. Maybe they want to capture some stuff and use it in a customer portal. They don't need our entire stack. They only need specific elements of it. So we broke it all down. And this is how more or less, oh, he's scrolling correctly. Yeah, this is more or less how it looks today. So in, center, out, uh, left, right. So on the left, you see, you know, starting from the classic, we have all of the uh, VoIP platforms that we support natively. And of course, this doesn't include anything that you can port mirror or just span to the platform. It doesn't matter. But asterisk freeze, which I mean, open, SIPs, RTP engine, RTP proxy, they all come with uh, native HEP support. So you flip a switch and they're sending data to our platform. Uh, we now have also a harder uh, set of agent that we use for uh, just normal sniffing, statistics, lawful interception, a bunch of purposes, which is done in partnership with Kubro. And then we have all of the newcomers. So we have uh, Janus, MediaSoup, and Jitsimi now are finally first-class citizens into the platform. 
uh, all of these splits between two uh, main sockets. One is the HEP one that you're probably already familiar with. So that's our encapsulation protocol, which is native in those platforms that we mentioned. The other one is just a generic JSON socket that we use to receive uh, whatever you send to it. And uh, inside of this socket, we have uh, processors or pipelines that, that are modular, where we can decide, hey, here's a new uh, type of report that uh, you know, Jitsi uh, Meet is going to send from the browser. And from those reports, we can go and tap out any data. So this is completely dynamic. It's not something that's hard coded because those events are not uh, you know, uh, based on specs. They might change. Maybe next week, there's a new metric being shipped out by one of these products that you want to make a use for. So we try to make it easy for this to, uh, to be possible. Once data makes it into Homer, it gets, uh, of course, processed, indexed, prepared for correlation. And then it splits into these three main groups that you see uh, on the right. So TS is for time series. Data is for whatever we index and we make searchable. And logs are logs. So the lowest, let's say, for in based on complexity, there are you know, different use cases, different types of data that we want to handle. And now they're all separate. So we have those three nice pipelines with the same event. We can choose, hey, let's pick those uh, you know, two uh, properties and store them in the database for search. Let's take those three metrics and send them to Prometheus or InfluxDB or whatever we want. And you can mix all of the above. So what we really wanted is to just give people finally the choice, the option to do what they want. Uh, why? Because we find that a lot of our users and customers already have some of those systems. They already use them. They're already tracking you know, uh, system load or some other applications uh, uh, status and events somewhere. And we just want to make it easy to plug into those uh, uh, platforms, be it metrics, logs, and whatever else. So you see here on the list, uh, InfluxDB, Prometheus, and Elastic are mainly uh, the, the three most popular targets that we have for uh, statistics. But you know, uh, Elastic, for instance, can take all documents. So you could build a Homer that just sends everything to Elasticsearch, and that's all you have. You don't have a UI. You don't have any of our databases. You just stream it all there and hopefully mix it with other data that you have. Same for time series and so on and so forth. We'll get into more detail. Internally, uh, it's all simplified. So we have those sockets. We come with those two initial ones, but you know, uh, hopefully people will contribute more or extend them. Uh, we have the API, which is mostly used for you know, connecting to the user interface and the clients and so on. Uh, and the, the two main features that I mentioned before, and uh, you know, this is just fresh uh, out of the oven, so I, you know, I, I decided not to go into a lot of technical detail, but rather explain how they work. Uh, proto mapping is the stage where we define what comes into the platform from either of the sockets. Uh, so, uh, of course, once we parse everything, it becomes a JSON object. From this JSON object, we can start and deciding what we're going to use for what. So maybe that's a specific header that we're going to elect for correlation. Maybe there are specific headers that we want to be indexed in a certain way, that we want to be wildcard searchable, or I don't know. Uh, the integrator will decide for the majority of cases. And on top of these proto mapping rules, we have correlation rules. So uh, for those of you that use the old Homer, correlation was sort of a static concept. So you were going, for instance, from a call ID and trying uh, and adding suffixes, postfixes, or maybe extracting an XE ID to find what was the next step. Uh, on, in Homer 7, this is a cascading concept. So a C flag could find another C flag. This other C flag could find a log. This log could find uh, media statistics, and so on and so forth. Of course, it can be a circular concept if that's the case, but you get the gist. So we just want each method to be able to find more information and bring it all together. Um, there's a new, of course, user interface to uh, leverage all of the above. It's based on uh, Epic, which is the uh, commercial uh, version, hey, Tari, of our stack. Um, so this brings a whole lot of uh, you know, new features into the experience. The old uh, Homer 5 interface, I think, is the main reason why we don't get a lot of contributions. It was homemade. It was a mess. It was something that only we could understand. And not always. You know, there's parts that me and Alexander were going back through, and you know, we also couldn't read it. So we decided to take it all, throw it in the bin, and uh, have somebody redesign this properly. So this is now uh, uh, a proper UI where you know, a web developer can come in and within hopefully 10, 15 minutes make the extension that they want without getting into our mind. I'm Italian, is, you know, I mean, our cultures, I think, are probably the issue here. So this is no longer the limitation. There's other people working on this, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. So you know, we run uh, a time-based uh, or time-range application. Uh, we have widgets, which are mainly uh, useful for displaying charts or uh, looking for data. Uh, the latest addition that you see here is Loki support. So uh, Homer is now a full 
uh, fledged Loki uh, client. So we can search uh, using uh, the tags and stuff, the same way that Grafana does in the latest release, Homer is already able of doing. So you can send uh, zip or logs or whatever it is that you want to store as a simple log with labels to Loki as opposed to the main database. So we can now even create different storage types for the data that we send. And the beauty of it is that uh, Loki, of course, is uh, providing labels, so the search is dynamic as you type. Uh, you get all of the options, and it's really easy to uh, get data together. Of course, logs correlate to SIP, SIP correlate to logs, so it doesn't matter where you start, you're always going to end up with the full stack of information. Uh, time range selection, just like the previous version, everything that you have on a dashboard, everything that you're doing is based on a range that you have uh, selected or that you're you know, changing as you go. Typical case, you know, what's happening in the last 24 hours? Ooh, there's a spike, let me zoom into that. What is that spike from? Going back to the logs, messages, or statistics that are behind it. Um, we mentioned custom protocols uh, and statistics. So this is a zoom into how those uh, widgets are configured. Uh, we currently support InfluxDB and Prometheus, so uh, the Homer UI can display data straight off those two platforms without mirroring, without doing anything. So we write to them and we read from them in terms of displaying it. Uh, Multi-select, I mean, this works pretty much just like, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's based on the original. So for the InfluxDB uh, widget, it's loosely based on how Chronograph works. For the Prometheus one, of course, uh, how Prometheus works. Uh, widgets for search specifically can be fully customized. So if we're talking about SIP, we're going to have, uh, you know, all of the standard SIP headers. But what if we're talking about uh, GC events? What do they have? What, what are the headers that we care about? And do we really care about the same ones? So users here can, or integrators here, can choose what they index, as we said. And of course, everything that they index becomes available into this dynamic form. So if you have 10 fields, any of your users can choose whatever fields they want to uh, have on their desk every day. So to make it comfortable. <coughs> Inside of those widgets, uh, I don't see the time. I'm going to check it. Good. Inside of those widgets, uh, everything is, again, dynamic. So uh, you can see here an example for some protocols that we have in our test stack. So we have SIP, we have logs, we have RTP reports, which now can be indexed as searchable data if you have that need in your you know, uh, support case. Uh, we have the Janus protocol. I didn't make it in time to add Jitsi, but that's what we implemented uh, just over the last few days. So uh, search results are dynamic tables. Depending on what they are, they display different columns. When you select one of those rows, the system starts, the, uh, uh, it starts fetching all of those correlated legs and correlated information. So you start from a SIP session. You end up with maybe three SIP sessions because they're correlated, some logs, so on and so forth. I don't want to get into more detail about this because I guess everybody is pretty much familiar with the, the scope of this application. We display everything as flows. This now includes anything that's captured. So previous versions, this was only valid for SIP or let's say network uh, type of events. Now it's everything that we capture. So in the, in the flow, you will see logs, you will see RTCP statistics, you will see whatever you send to the platform that belongs there. Um, so the juicy part, RTC time series. And for this, I'm going to zoom into that uh, previous image. Um, how do we do this? So Janus has its own type of events and they're you know, uh, completely different from those of MediaSoup and sure enough, completely different from those of Jitsi. Uh, what we didn't want here is to create uh, an adapter for each. So the JSON socket that we have is simply able to recognize types by the properties that they're carrying. So yes, um, let's say for the Jitsi events, the way we collect them right now is not from the server, but rather from the browser. So we use the analytics, uh, I don't remember what it's called, function, where you can inject a library into uh, your uh, Jitsi client, just like they do for uh, Google Analytics or call stats. We can take all of those events, instead of sending them to you know, somebody else's uh, storage, we send it to our own, we index them the way we want, and we can make sense of them, uh, mostly as time series, because you know, it doesn't really make sense to keep any of those events as originals. Uh, but when you start extracting, you know, the uh, round trip time, the jitter, whatever else, uh, you can create really, really nice features such as this one. So, you know, you, you can in instantly start tapping into what your platforms are measuring. You can decide how you tag those platforms. So is it going to be by IP? Are you going to give each uh, your own name? Uh, that maybe it comes from signaling. Maybe you have a uh, specific field within the events that tells you who's the customer. All of this is now programmable. So any of you, hopefully can go in, can use it for you know, the standard stuff, so whatever is common within those platforms. But if you're developing one of those platforms, uh, the best part is that you can exactly start 
um, offloading you know, some of the, the tasks directly into Homer. Uh, this is an example of the same in Elasticsearch. So as we said, now you're free to store whatever data you want, wherever you want. Uh, by default, we use Postgres for index data. Uh, five? Yeah. Uh, Postgres for index data, but again, you want to send it to Elastic, do it. You want to make statistics uh, in another platform, great. Uh, freedom is, the, is really the key here. So uh, this said, last few minutes, why should you use Homer and Homer 7 specifically? Um, the first reason is that it's now full feature. So the previous platform, by our own admission, you know, had uh, several limitations that were uh, kind of you know, restricting the use cases. This is no longer the case. So we should be ready for anything. We should be ready for you know, the generating time series, indexing, whatever we want. We're vendor agnostic, so by now it's been uh, many, many, many years. And I think we work with everything and anything out there. Uh, some of our customers are incredibly large, so we also follow, you know, tier one uh, networks, Fortune hundreds out there. It's incredible, you know, when how you know large enterprises, how many phones they have, and now finally they realize, oh, I have to monitor this stuff. So we've seen it all, and we designed this to stay agnostic. So we don't care about anything specific. Compatibility is uh, global. Uh, HEP native, of course, this is a booster. You know, all of the platforms that already support HEP, you don't have to do anything to use. And finally, it's important. So, uh, there's a model uh, behind this, so Homer 5, uh, again, was a little bit of uh, an original concept. This one is standardized, so we can support it uh, more efficiently. The use cases, of course, packet capture, uh, which was the previous one, RTC analytics, which is the new chapter that we're really focusing on, so uh, talking to anything. Troubleshooting, doing alerting and alarms based on all of these new data that we now collect, intersect, and correlate. Uh, big data, because we can stream whatever we're uh, extracting to anything. And finally, machine learning, which is the new opening. Uh, so this data, it's really easy to use it for something. And uh, we have a different presentation for that that doesn't fit today. Lessons learned with Homer and using Homer. Uh, there's a thin line between love and hate. Your customers get pissed really easy, especially the big ones. So if you cannot offer them a good support model, if you cannot understand what their problem is, they're going to leave for somebody who does. Uh, early birds get to find the best bugs. If you start monitoring when you start designing, you don't have a problem to solve later. You already know, you know the initial issues. You don't force your customer going through the bugs that you don't even have visibility over. Uh, complexity is the hardest thing to capture. The later you do it, the worse it's going to be. When you go and try to capture already uh, you know, a complex system that spans over 12 data centers and already has 12 protocols uh, going in ways that not even the engineers understand, go and explain it to the monitoring guy. Good luck. You know, we're going to take weeks just to understand what the problem is. So doing it early pays off. And then, of course, the higher you fly, the harder you fall. When you have a lot of traffic and you start you know, uh, having issues, uh, it does cost money. So working on this early is really uh, paying off to, to many of the customers that we're working with. Installing uh, the easy way, Docker. So we have Docker containers for everything. There's already recipes that mix all of the features. So hopefully you can go in there and find something that falls close to your use case and use it as a starting point. If you don't find it, Open Initial will do it. Um, how to support Homer? By using it, uh, by talking about it, by letting us know why you even don't use it sometimes or what's preventing you from you know, taking it where you need. We need community input. So uh, we've been working really, really hard to keep you know, everything open source. Uh, to keep it useful. Now also other platforms are able to use the HEP <coughs> protocol to do the same thing that we're doing and we're super excited about it, but we really need you know, the community feedback to understand what we're doing right and wrong. Uh, are there any questions? I don't think I have any time. Yeah, we, got two we got two minutes? Two minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question? And keep in mind, you get a shirt if you do. <laughs> yes. What's your uh, specific usage for uh, HEP, this uh, important protocol that uh, uh, seems that uh, is going for the yeah. most uh, or transport for data analysis? Well, HEP, what we were hoping for HEP was it to be a generic uh, that anybody could use to make a platform to make the same thing that we're doing or to make it easy for somebody to monitor you know, a new product that we're, we're making. So what we're hoping for it is that it, you know, it continues or it becomes a standard that more and more platforms endorse, and we hope not to be the only ones using it, and I think in the next presentation we'll find out that we're not. I hope I make it there. 
What's the relationship between uh, uh, HEPIC and uh, the, the HOMA product? Uh, the HEP protocol, really. HEPIC is something that we uh, designed because some really large companies, apparently, they really don't want any open source into their platform. So we kind of have two tracks. HEPIC is something that's more designed for the very large uh, and complex network for you know people that need to spend money to do it. HOMA does really the same, but you know it's uh, fully community. So they don't have any code in common. They're just using the very same uh, encapsulation protocol, and they go for the same goal. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> so my question is, what's the compatibility between Homer 5 and Homer 7? Uh, in terms of uh, capture agent, 100%. So they still use the HEP protocol. Nothing changes. Everybody that was okay, uh, able to was send. Interesting. Yeah, HEP 3. <laughs> let's say from HEP 3 up, uh, it's all the same. So uh, OpenSIPS remains the leading uh, citizen in terms of variety. But anybody that sends HEP, it's able to continue. Cool. Uh, the difference is in the JSON socket. So now we're able to get also those non-structured events and yeah. whatnot. Thank you. <laughs> those shirts are nice. Come on, guys. Right. One more. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, short. I'll bring you one. Um, is it packaged uh, in uh, some uh, distribution? Or Not yet, uh, no, uh, mostly because it's very modular. So the way that you assemble it makes it into many f pieces. Hopefully you don't need all of them. So no, we don't have that yet. Actually, you know, we've we never been huge fans of making static packages also because you know, it's different technologies. But we'll get there, hopefully, as a contribution. Thanks, man. So Thank you. Well, you get it anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much.